All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started on chapter 37. This is over patients with spe uh, special populations. And so this chapter is not very complicated, but there's some things that I think are commonly confused. Like students will confuse the difference between like Down syndrome and autism and, 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 and cerebral palsy. And while they can have a little bit of overlap, they are distinctly different. And so we'll talk about some of those things. So these are like not, I mean, um, not per se everyday patients, but like people with hearing issues and stuff like that, but they're still patients and um, they, like, especially like autism or I mean, sorry, Down syndrome and stuff like that, they have pretty unique medical problems that we should know about. And so that's kind of what this is covering. Okay. And so today more than ever, right, people are living at home with chronic disease. This is thanks to home health and telemedicine and the advances in medicine and technology. Right. And so patients with special pet challenges, uh, uh, patients with diseases resulting in altered body function, you know, so this could be like a quadriplegic or a stroke survivor or something like that. Uh, patients with sensory deficits. Um, so again, this could be someone that's blind or hearing impaired or, uh, you know, sensory overload, like what you could see in like autism. Uh, and then geriatric patients with chronic diseases. And so really, you know, we run a lot of these. And so uh, some patients depend on mechanical ventilation, IV pumps, other devices, home, at home dialysis, oxygen equipment, you know, all these other things. And so, uh, you know, don't be distracted by that equipment. These are still humans. These are still just patients. And so at the end of the day, we got to focus on circulation, airway, breathing. And so that's what we do. Um, now, there's a couple of additional considerations that we'll use. But at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're just, you know, they're still patients. And so just focus on the patient and solve their problems. And so... Um, we used to use the word, this is a word that I encourage you to not use, is uh, like, oh, that's or the retarded, right? And the word retarded literally means slow. Like, like, if, like if the timing on your engine's delayed, right, they call it retarded, right? And so um, it literally just means the word slow. And so um, we don't really use that word anymore. It's more derogatory. It used to be used in the medical literature, but not anymore. What we'll use is words like, you know, they have a mental or cognitive intellectual disability, right? Or just say they're intellectually disabled. And so, um, you know, there's different types of these disabilities, but just, just be careful using the R word. Um, it, it's just not, it just doesn't serve anything, right? And so uh, we should just use the more correct word. Uh, they're intellectually disabled, okay? And so uh, the, the development for develop, de developmental disability, conditions that may impair development with physical ability, learning, uh, language development, behavioral coping skills, right? So this is someone who has not developed properly, right? And so, you know, as we age, you know, you from age three to 10, right? You should no longer be speaking, behaving like a three-year-old. That would be what's normal, but there's certainly pathophysiology and genetic disorders and environmental factors that can have someone, you know, stay at age three with their intellectual ability. And so you could very well run a patient that's 25 years old that has the intellectual ability of a three-year-old. And so sometimes the family will tell you that, like, oh, you can talk to him, but he, he has a, you know, he, he has about the mind of a three-year-old or something like that. And so that's not uncommon uh, that, that the family will tell you kind of like what their, their level's at. And so, uh, you know, intellectual disability, uh, the subset of developmental disability. So this is someone's like their intellectual function, skills need for daily living. So, you know, like, like um, intellectual disability, like, like what they're saying, like, like they may not be able to drive a car or to dress themselves or pay their own bills or stuff like that. So that would be like examples of intellectual disabilities. And so there's a lot of different causes. We'll talk about these, right? But genetic factors like Down syndrome, um, congenital infections like rubella, uh, RSV, or not RSV, uh, CMV, cytomegalovirus. Um, you know, there, there's some up, maybe, uh, those are probably the bigger ones. I mean, yeah, I can't think of other ones that would be really big. I mean, there are some other ones, but those are probably the, you know, groupie strep, perhaps, uh, stuff like that. Uh, malnutrition. So this isn't really much of a problem in the United States anymore, but um, there are certainly countries that have mal, uh, mal like, you know, in, in third world countries, the child is malnourished. So they end up with like Quashicor or something like that. And so, you, you know, you don't want that, but that that's certainly a cause. Uh, again, if you if severely malnourished uh, children could have a, what's called a... Uh, 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 gosh, my brain's so blank today. Um, I can't think of the word. It's low thyroid. And so they, they present, it starts with a C. I can't think of the word though. They present with a certain set of, uh, symptoms, but you know, if like if a child has iodine deficiency in their diet, which is rare in the United States, uh, you could have this disorder, but environmental factors. So again, this could be like, uh, familial abuse. This could be, you know, obviously temperature issues, you know, um, 
social issues. There, I mean, there's a lot of things that could play into that. This is a very, very common one. We've talked about this. Fetal alcohol syndrome is the most common cause of intellectual disability in the United States. This is when mom drinks during pregnancy knowingly or unknowingly, and it d damages the fetal development. So uh, it's, it's the most common cause of, of that in the United States. Traumatic uh, brain injury. So, you know, you could see this from like chicken baby syndrome or from, you know, a true trauma like a car wreck or fall or something like that. Um, and then poisoning, obviously, could cause these intellectual disabilities. So um, patients with intellectual disabilities will rely on uh, patients and family members for information. So w w you have to really rely on the family tip. What I've seen historically is the, the, the caregivers are excellent historians, right? And so you'll even see this clinically in the clinic. You'll see it in the ambulance in the hospital. But uh, one thing I want to caution you um, is to respect their knowledge, right? They may not be an EMT or a paramedic or a doctor, but they are generally are subject matter experts in that patient's health, right? And so They've been following this patient from, from birth, perhaps, um, and, and keeping going to all their doctor's appointments and asking the questions on their behalf and keeping up with their records. And, you know, so these are experts. And so I, I also encourage you to recognize these are experts when it comes to their medical equipment, right? Every day they're using that ventilator. Every day they're, they're giving them, or not every day, but or yeah, every day they're giving them dialysis at home or they're, they're caring for them. So they tend to be subject matter experts. So just be aware of that and respect that. Um, they've earned that badge to be a subject matter expert in that care, okay? And so uh, patients may have difficulty adjusting to change or a break in routine. Sure, patients with intellectual disabilities are susceptible to the same disease as other patients. Now I'll say, uh, like, like again, Down syndrome, they have, they can get everything that someone else can get, like a normal patient, but there's, there's more issues that they could have as well. So these patients tend to get really sick. So we start off with this disorder called autism spectrum disorder. And so it's important to know that autism is, is on a spectrum, but it's not a linear spectrum, right? It's more uh, circular. And so it's it's not like, oh, you, you know, it's you have it really mild versus really severe. And, and so we can do that. And that's what, you know, this picture is talking about. But that's really not how uh, diag uh, the diagnosis of autism is made, you know, is, is supported. It's, it's, it's not linear, right? It's not on a line. Um, it's more uh, all encompassing and like a circuit like this, right? And so... I'll just read you this definition and tell you my definition. So autism spectrum disorder, it's intellectual disability characterized by deficits in social communication, right? Along with restrictive, repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, and activities, okay? And so, you know, maybe you've heard of Asperger's syndrome or someone with just straight up autism or something like that. Um, the, the, the key hallmark of autism is social issues, right? And so, they may not behave well in a crowd, or they may uh, be overstimulated by the noises in a restaurant, or they may have sensory issues, or like where the you know they need to be more stimulated or they need to be less stimulated. Um, so again, that's on a spectrum. But um, these patients can go on and live a very normal, fruitful life, um, and and oftentimes autism cannot be can be never diagnosed properly, right? Like so, someone has autism, we, we it was never diagnosed. And so that's not uncommon. Like these, di this diagnosis is missed quite often. And so you know, this is uh, uh, if if I had this, just put autism. Like, what is autism? So autism equals social issues, right? They have social issues, whether they're like repetitively tapping or grunting or you know whatever it is. And so what I've seen too, um, there's actually a kid in my medical school. This is crazy, who has Asperger's. So that's on the spectrum of autism. And like his obsession is blood disorders. It's very odd. He's a very nice guy, very sweet, but um, he's very interested in blood disorders. And so what you'll also see is they tend to fixate on like one thing. And so maybe you've seen someone with autism that's like a piano prodigy or a math prodigy or like they, they these are they're very artistic or very interested in one thing and they just become very, you know, good at that. Um, and so that's one of the things that you'll see. And so how do we diagnose autism in children is typically when they don't have social smiles, right? So normally babies, I think around like six months at least, they should they should be socially smiling to their parents. Uh, when they don't do that, right, that would be like, oh, maybe the kid has autism. And then so, you know, you can, there's testing. And, you know, again, this, this diagnosis is, is on a spectrum, so it can change and move. And so, uh, you know, this is kind of all the... The, the different, you know, I'll just read you some of these, right? So common autistic traits is difficulty initiating and maintaining conversations. Again, social issue, uh, difference in gestures, facial expressions, and eye contact. So like a lot of times they'll look down or uh, they blink rapidly. I mean, I've seen that too. 
Uh, intense focus on specific subjects or topics. Like we've told you that. Uh, repeated motor movement, speech, or routine. So a lot of times these people can almost have like tick-like behaviors, right? To where they grunt, where they move their shirt, or they, they whatever it is to uh, that they do. Now I also know they tend to be very routine-based, uh, right? And so uh, when they get out of the routine, it can really derail their day, and they can't adapt to that. Uh, over or under response to sensory input again. So like in public. Uh, it could be overstimulating where they need to wear earmuffs and, uh, you know, try to avoid those very stimulating environments. But I've also seen it where they need more stimulation and they have like gadgets and toys to keep their mind stimulated. Uh, and then so challenge with uh, understanding social norms. So they may not understand humor and comic and, and you know, and stuff like that. And so th they, they certainly can struggle with that. Again, it's a social issue and then um, difference in uh, support needs. So just be aware of that. Um, so they could have abnormal sensory things like, you know, they may not like the hot, cold, hugging, singing, removing clothes. So just be aware of that. Things that would normally be socially acceptable may not be for them. So these are the patients you need to move real carefully and try to not overwhelm them. Be very thorough. Maybe have the caregiver like the parent or something like that help you uh, in the care. And so uh, may have increased sensory to noise or physical stimulation, right? And so, again, you just want to be calm. I say it all the time. Chaos is contagious, but you don't want to overstimulate these patients. Um, and then so demonstration of examination techniques where on a trusted individual may comfort the patient. So say you need to listen to the lungs. You may listen to mom's lungs first uh, to show, hey, it's not painful. We're just listening with my little stethoscope, right? And so blood pressure, you know, be careful saying the words blood. It's almost like a kid, right? I don't use the word blood pressure. Say, hey, can my little machine right here give your arm a little hug? Stuff like that, you know. Um, so use short, direct, simple phrases when communicating. Allow extra time for the patient to process the communication if possible. Again, if you rush these patients... Like, all right, they need to blah, 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 and like really rush and like push them to hurry up, you can end up with problems. So I don't recommend that. Um, okay, so that's Down syndrome, or I'm sorry, autism uh, disorder. It's on spectrum. Now, Down syndrome is different. And so Down syndrome, we've, we've seen, this is actually fairly common in the United States. I think it's like one in 500 maybe. Uh, births will have Down syndrome. And so this is a chromosomal, this is a genetic issue, right? And so normally we have, you know, 46 sets of chromosomes, but in, 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 in Down syndrome, like especially on the 21st chromosome, right, you should have like, let's just say it's XY, uh, they might have XXY. So we call this trisomy 21. And so this is the most common form of Down syndrome. And so it's genetic, right? So they're born this way. And so um, this is, this will create this big, very, well, let me say that big. It creates a very common pattern, right? So you've probably seen someone with Down syndrome and recognize they look very similar, right? And so I'll talk about some of the facial features, but this is because it's a genetic issue. And so uh, you can get mild to severe intellectual impairment, right? And so uh, one thing we do know is that increased maternal age like greatly increases the uh, the chance of, of, of Down syndrome. And so, in fact, I think if someone over the age of 45 uh, has a child, there's a 1 in 10 chance they'll have Down syndrome. It's very high. Um, so it increases with maternal age. That's mom's age. So as mom gets older and decides to have a baby, uh, there's a much, 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 much higher chance of Down syndrome. And so they have a, like a very distinct facial features, right? And so, again, it's because it's genetic. And so what you'll see is these slanted, upturned eyes. And they can also have what's called hypertellurism, right, where their eyes are widely spaced. And so you can almost see that in this one. They didn't describe it, but uh, you can see how wide the gap is between the eyes. Okay, they'll have this flat nasal or this flat uh, nose bone, um, and then they also usually have a short neck. They can also have jaw issues as well, like small jaws. And so you know you can see that in this patient. You can see how wide the space is between her eyes. She has this flat nose. Her jaw is not a normal rounded, like very squared off jaw. So, you know, I'm like, well, why am I talking about a jaw? Well, if you're using a BVM, this can be very difficult because of their nose and jaw, because what are we using to rest the mask on their nose and jaw? And so that can create its own problems. Also, they tend to have a round head with a flat occiput, right? That's the back of the head. They have these really big tongues, okay? And so with intubation and inserting an OPA and stuff like that, it can become much more difficult. And so interestingly, the, 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 these kids are at a, a much, much higher risk of leukemia, a certain type of leukemia. And so uh, well, remember, leukemia is a, disorder, is a cancer of the white blood cells. And so they can get these leukemias, which can obviously be very fatal um, and difficult to treat. Um, one, and, and it's because it's genetic that this happens. And then two, they have these, uh, these uh, congenital heart defects. So they'll have a hole in the wall. 
between their ventricle and their and their ventricles. So it's a ventricle septal de defect. And so basically, you know, the ventricles are the bottom of the heart and there shouldn't be a hole there. But if there's a hole there, you can shunt blood left and right and right and left, depending on how old they are. Um, and that can create all sorts of, of problems for the patient. And so uh, those are some of the common issues that you'll get. You, can, you know, also Alzheimer's risk is extremely high in Down syndrome. These patients usually don't live past 50. Um, and so just be aware of that. So the mask ventilation will be difficult because of their large tongue and their small oral and nasal cavities, right? Uh, they also have different jaws. They also have different noses, okay? Um, and so the jaw thrust maneuver uh, or a nasopharyngeal uh, airway may be necessary just to open up the airway. Again, they have really, really big tongues. And so management of seizures is the same for any patient. So the lano-axial joint is unstable in approximately 15% of uh, uh, Down syndrome patients. So what's the lano-axial joint? It's the joint right here in the back of your head that holds your skull into your spinal cord or your spine. And, um, and so there's increased risk of uh, complications when they experience trauma. So like, you know, um, if, if this joint that's holding your head onto your spine is unstable in 15% of these patients, you know, you can imagine if they fall and smack their head, the consequences that could happen. So that's why they're telling you that, okay? So again, approach these patients calmly and slowly. Establish rapport. I'm not saying you treat them like children, but they may have the intellectual ability of someone who's younger. So a lot of times I change my approach to how I would approach a child. It's less professional. It's not unprofessional. It's less formal, right? So it's like, hey, you know, you know, my name's Hunter. I'm here to help. And so saying, hi, my name's Hunter. I'm a paramedic with the Park County Hospital District. What's, what, you know? What, how can I help you today, right? So it's a little less formal with these types of patients uh, to establish that rapport, that friendliness, okay? Um, if you're real formal and like excessively professional, it could be intimidating and turn, a turn off to them. And so, you know, explain what you're doing, uh, move slowly but deliberately, stay at eye level with the patient, right? Okay. Now patients with uh, brain injuries, this could be obviously from trauma. So this could be adults, children, right? And so, they could obviously have be intellectually disabled if, if they have like a de, you know diffuse axonal injuries right and so we're we're like a you know severe brain injury uh, hypoxia even right and so you know it's going to be very similar and so uh, visual impairment so there's possible causes right so congenital defect disease you know like uh, 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 chlamydia is the most common cause of, of blindness in the world actually uh, in, in the undeveloped parts of the world uh, and so uh, the degeneration of the eyeball optic nerve or nerve pathway could be impaired. So like, again, this could be genetic, it could be environmental, it could be disease. It could be, it could, there's a lot of reasons people can have visual impairment. And so um, this is obviously going to vary. Some people could have, like, like I have astigmatism, and I guess that's a little bit of a visual issue, but uh, or be fully blind. And so uh, people could be blind in one eye. They could be blind in both eyes. They could have macular degeneration, right? They could have all these scotomas or whatever these issues are. Uh, and so just be aware of that. And so... You know, there, some patients could have loss of peripheral, which is like the outside vision or central vision. Some can't distinguish light or dark shapes or, or from dark or shapes. You know, there's, there, you know, there's colorblind. Colorblind is much, much more common in men. Um, it almost exclusively happens in men. And the most common is red-green colorblindness. And so, uh, you know, make yourself known when you enter the room. So this is where you have to be really good at describing things. Um, introduce yourself, uh, retrieve any visual aids and give them to the patient, maybe their glasses or whatever they're using. Um, uh, the patients are going to feel vulnerable and disoriented. So imagine um, you're extremely sick. You call 911, right? You as the EMT student and I, you know, wrap a blindfold around your eyes. Now I'm like, okay, now we're on the call. <laughs> you know, how are you going to feel as the patient? It's not great. And so just try to use the empathy and put yourself in their shoes for that, right? And so um, you know, you could take it. Sometimes they'll use a walker or a, uh, a, a it's not, I, I think it's called a, a seeing stick to where like, you know, you've seen them sweep the ground, right? That stays in front of them that helps them with through touch to, to learn about their environment. Okay. And so make arrangements for care of accompaniment of the service animals. So uh, this is actually a very important point. I've seen this tested. If they have a service animal, they are allowed to go to the hospital and ride in the ambulance. So you should make that happen. Don't separate them. Um, Patients should be gently guided, never pulled or pushed, you know, don't rough housing, uh, communicate obstacles in advance. So, okay, there's going to be a step coming down or there's, you know, we're about to enter a door. So, you know, or just stuff like that. Just communicate with them. Hearing impairment. Um, this is obviously common as well. And so this could also be on a, on a spectrum, right? And so you have mild hearing impairment. They could have a lot. Um, and so 
which where they're totally deaf. And so this is fairly common in older people, as we've talked about in the previous chapter. And so there's two different types of, of, of hearing uh, loss, mainly, right? The first one, sensorineural uh, hearing loss, right? Or sensorineural uh, deafness. And so this is nerve issues, right? There's something wrong from the ear going to the brain, okay? And so this is like a, a very, this is very, I mean, you can't fix nerves. And so uh, this is like the patients that are usually like born deaf would be an example. Um, and so uh, that's, I want you to see when you see this word, the word neural as in like, oh, that's a nerve. This is a nerve issue, okay? Now, the other one being conductive hearing loss, this is different. This is like, uh, faulty transmission of sound waves. So, you know, I could induce hearing loss by putting a lot of wax in your ear, right? That that's you're not going to be able to get those sound waves through that wax into your ear. So that's an example of conductive hearing loss that's reversible. And so, uh, you know, that, that that's the difference between the two. Conductive hearing loss is you can't conduct the sound waves through. Usually, there's like an obstruction or there's some malformation in your ear or your old ears really old and 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 the hairs in there are, are hardened. You know, that's conductive hearing loss, uh, the, by far the most common cause of hearing loss. And then sensorineural hearing loss is, has to do with the nerve, okay? And so um, clues that a person could be hearing impaired is presence of hearing aids, um, poor pronunciation of words. I'm sure you've heard someone who is deaf speak. It, it tends to have a very distinct sound. Um, and so if you don't know what that looks like, you could look it up on YouTube. And failure to respond to your presence or questions. And so... Uh, you know, how do you communicate with these people? You could, I'm just reading this to you, but assist the patient with finding and inserting any hearing aids. I've had to do that. Uh, also, hearing aids are extremely expensive, so be very careful in the care of these and, and the custody of these and maintaining them and not losing them or breaking them. Um, because think about it, if, you know, if, some, if you break or lose the patient's hearing aids, they could be months or even years without a hearing aid because they're very, very expensive. And insurance is going to replace them just because the EMT lost them. And so, uh, face the patient when you communicate. Do not exaggerate your lip movements or look away. And so, uh, a lot of times, um, you know, you'll, you'll, they read your lips. They become very skilled at that. And so, just talk normal, and they can usually understand uh, what you're saying. It's actually quite impressive. Uh, position yourself approximately 18 inches directly in front of the patient, right? And so, you know, if you're reading my lips from the side, right, that's a lot more difficult, right? And so if I'm looking at you straight on, it's a lot easier. So you want to be straight on with them. So do not speak louder. And this is a common thing that they'll test. I've seen this tested. Um, but you want to lower the pitch of your voice. And you're like, what? What's your pitch? Your pitch is like the base of your voice. Um, that Those waves will travel better through, like, especially with conductive hearing loss, than a high-pitched voice. So let's say you have a male-female partner. The male, because they have lower voices generally, um, will will be able to communicate better with like a hearing-impaired patient. And so what I've seen, especially women do this a lot, is when you know they get when when typically when people get loud, they get higher in pitch, and so you're not really helping. And so uh, a lower pitch tends to help communicate with them. ASL could be helpful. Um, and to provide paper and pencil to write, you know, you could even do this through text messaging or something like that. Uh, only one person asks questions, and then the reverse stethoscope is where the patient would wear this the stethoscope in his ears, and you would talk into the bell. Never done that, but that would be rare. Some random sign language that you're not going to remember, but there you go. Now, hearing aids uh, sound uh, make sound louder, and so uh, they can be external or internal, and so there's several types available, right? And these are actually over the counter now. You don't need a prescription for some of them. And so there's some that are behind the ear. There's some that are in the end canal or inside the ear canal, in the ear. There's, there's, there's several. There's some that are cochlear implants. There's several different types. Now, if you've ever heard hearing waves and there's, there's feedback, that whistling sound, it means that it may not be pushed in far enough into the ear. So you may have to help the patient with adjusting that and, and pushing it into the ear a little bit further, you know. That's pretty common. And, and if you put them together, they whistle and it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's surprisingly loud and the patient doesn't hear it. So, but anyways, those are different types. And so, uh, you know, as technology advances, these are getting smaller and more advanced. So, uh, you know, I don't have much more to add on hearing aids. But anyway, cerebral palsy. So th the thing to know about cerebral palsy is it's caused by, by this, right? Damage to the brain in utero or at birth, okay? And so 
This is typically around birth. For some reason, the kid got hypoxic in the brain. Okay. And so when they're little kids and they get really hypoxic, then, then they can have these issues. And so um, it can create a very distinct pattern because what you normally see is this. You normally see poor body movement. So if y'all remember Walt Jr., these are all celebrities, I don't know, um, from Breaking Bad, that he has, that's a real life kid with cerebral palsy. And so, you know, he really does walk with those, with those crutches. And so he has a little bit of that like slower uh, or lower or slow speech, um, but he's not necessarily like fully intellectually disabled or, or anything like that. He's just, uh, you know, he, he, he has cerebral palsy. And so again, cerebral palsy can be super severe, um, but what, you know, what I've seen is it, these can be uh, uh, intellectually normal people with, with body issues and where these body issues tend to be is in their legs. And so, um, you know, because the issue is in their legs become very tense is what happens. And so they could have poor posture, uncontrolled spastic movements. Um, uh, I, I actually used to have a kid in my paramedic class. He's, he's currently a paramedic who had cerebral palsy. And so, you know, sometimes his, his legs would just give out. So he'd fall very sad. And, um, but I mean, kid was a trooper, really good student. And so, you know, they can occasionally like their legs will spasm and they fall. In fact, uh, some of the treatments for this is Botox injections into the legs, you know, like Botox for the forehead. Uh, you can inject that into the legs to paralyze those muscles to where they're not as spastic. And so, you know, they could have visual or hearing impairments, difficulty communicating, and uh, unsteady gait. And so they could be wheelchair, wheelchair bound. I've seen, you know, I've seen a kid in my class did not use crutches. Uh, you know, Walt Jr. obviously does use crutches. And so just be aware of that. Okay. And so, um, you know, observe the airway and the suction is needed. Do not assume intellectual disability. Again, they could have to, like a slower speech, but that doesn't mean that they're intellectually disabled, right? That doesn't mean that they're, you know, cognitively, you know, not sharp. And so be aware of that. Um, these underdeveloped limbs are prone to injury. It's because uh, the way, I'll, I think I have a pic. Yeah, I'll show you. The way, well, let me show you. This is like an example of cerebral palsy. See how their legs are go in a little bit? One, two, and two, these muscles are very tense. And so that creates problems for them with walking. And, and gait and posture and falling and all those issues. And so um, these bones are not lined up like a normal human's bones. And so you can end up with all these, uh, you know, you can end up with, with an easier fracture or, or injury because of that. Okay. Uh, they could be a toxic. A toxic means like you're almost walking like you're drunk or on steady gait makes the patient prone to falls and the patient may have a special pillow or chair. Now, um, Pad the patient to ensure comfort. Never force the extremities in position. I can't stress that enough. You'll see this in actually just old people. They have what's called contractures where their hands or their joint will be very tight. Uh, it's not your job to straighten that out. You could literally break their bones by doing that. And so don't do that. I mean, you'll see patients that are permanently like old, you know, uh, nursing home patients that are permanently locked up like this. They're like, oh my gosh, straighten out their arm for the blood pressure. No, you don't. Uh, take it somewhere else because you will break their arm if you try straightening it out. And so whenever possible, you know, take the walkers of wheelchair along with you during transport, uh, be prepared for a seizure and keep suction available. Now, the next disorder is called spina bifida, right? And so spina means the spine. So if they mention something's wrong with the spine, like a big old, you know, uh, meningocele or myelomeningocele or whatever it is, you need to be aware like, oh, that they're probably describing spina bifida. This is a neural tube defect. And what happens is in utero, usually in the first eight weeks of pregnancy, if the mom is deficient in, an, in, a, in a vitamin, um, you can end up with uh, a spina bifida. This could also have a genetic factor, but usually it's from a neural – it is a neural tube defect. And so these could be very uh, severe, like it's obviously very, very severe. And so this is a spinal cord and its contents protruding in the, from the lower back, by the way. But they're in a sac. They're not fully exposed for this one. So that's a uh, meningocell. And so – or it could be open. You could truly see the spinal cord. It's called a myelomeningocele. And so there's the, – these can be very major, okay? And so uh, – but something I want to point out, they could literally have what's just called a tuft of hair. And so if there's just like a little piece, you know, a few pieces of black hair on their lower spine above their butt crack, you know, that could be spina bifida. It's just not opened out in the skin. And so just be aware of that. Now, the problem with this is, you know, this spinal cord obviously connects directly to the brain. So you can end up with an addition, you know, too much uh, 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 fluid around the brain, cerebral spinal fluid. And so you could end up getting a condition known as hydrocephalus, which literally means water in the head, right? Cephalic, right? And so water in the head. And so this is sometimes we have to put what's called a shunt. 
which I'll show you a picture of this, where we put a, uh, a tube that drains this fluid down into the body. And so this is a kid with hydrocephalus, and you can see how big his head is. Remember, the baby's skull is not fully fused yet, and so the head can get really, really big um, when, when you pump it full of water. And so, or, or cerebral spinal fluid, and so that's where you'll get this problem. And so, um, you can get partial or full paralysis at the lower extremity. So it would be no surprise if you have a problem with your spinal cord here, right? That you, you know, that you could have issues down here. And so, uh, you can see part. I've seen both. You can have partial or full uh, paralysis, right? Loss of bowel and bladder control. Again, you could have problems from here down, and so your bowel and bladder could be a part of that. And extreme latex allergy. And so. Uh, the paralysis, you have inability to voluntarily control. Oh, so this is different. So that's spina bifida, okay? Now paralysis, we can get this after a stroke or from trauma or whatever, but this is the inability to voluntarily move body parts. And so this could be, you know, what's called uh, 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 paraplegia, right, where both legs are uh, uh, paralyzed. You've got quadriplegia, where all four extremities are paralyzed. You could have hemiplegia, where only one half, like the whole left half of the body is paralyzed. That's common after a stroke. You know, and so there's different ways this can present. And so uh, stroke, trauma, birth defects are all causes of this. Um, so car wrecks, spinal injuries, you know, all those can cause uh, these types of paralysis. And so uh, the thing to know is that motor neurons that, that control the, the muscles that we would use to walk are one thing. And so you could have pure motor sensory issues, but you could also have uh, motor and and or motor issues, but you could also have motor and sensory issues, right, to where, uh, which is probably more common where you don't have pure motor, but it's both motor and the, the sensory, right, the, the vibration, cold, temp, cold, hot, pain, uh, you know, uh, pressure, all of those can be impaired as well. Those go up different tracks and um, in the spinal cord. And so just be aware of that, that you could have normal sensation or what's called hyperthesia. So hyperthesia is, is, is excessive uh, sensation, okay? Or, or you could have less, it, it varies. And so uh, I would say this may even be a typo. Uh, what's more common is to have lack of sensation, right? And so that would be like paraparesis or hemiparesis, right? Where you don't have sensation on both legs, right? That's paraparesis or hemiparesis. You don't have sensation on the left side of your body. You know, and so the, the, the hemiplegia and hemiparesis tend to go together, but they don't have to because remember, those are distinct tracks within the spinal cord. They're not the same uh, tracks going at the spinal cord. Um, so the problem with when you have paralysis, like especially like quadriplegia and stuff like that, uh, spinal cord injuries, is you have to work, you know, the, the, the ventilator or the, the diaphragm is a muscle. And so if that's not being innervated, you could end up with uh, uh, th the patient not able to breathe. And so, you know, it's not uncommon for these patients to use urinary catheters. Again, if they're, if they're paralyzed, uh, like a paraplegic, they may not be able to use their bowels or their, their bladder. And so a lot of times they'll just uh, use a catheter and, and void into a bag. Tracheostomy tubes, we're going to talk about what that is. Colostomy bags, this is where we, we pull the colon out into the abdominal wall, and then you the patient will defecate into a bag. I'll show you what that looks like. Feeding tubes, this is where we'll put a tube in the stomach or the intestine to feed the patient and maintain their nutrition. Uh, also, they can have difficulty swallowing, and that could require suction, and so be aware of that as well. Um, uh, it's not uncommon after a stroke for the patient to not be able to... Uh, 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 be able to uh, swallow. And so uh, ask the patient what's the best way to move them prior to moving. And a lot of times we'll use, you know, a Hoyer lift or, uh, you know, like a sheet drag or something like that. But again, the patient's going to be subject matter expert in how to move them. And so they may say, oh, just help me. And we'll do it like this. And they'll describe how they like to be transferred from the bed to the stretcher or from their wheelchair to your cot or whatever. Now, bariatric patients is very, very, very common in the United States right now. Um, fun fact, where I live right now in McAllen is the f most obese city in, in the United States. And so um, you, th this is a endemic, right? Like this is a huge issue in, the, in, in America with our, with our, it's really in the Western world with the way we eat. And so, you know, someone's obese if their BMI is above 30, technically. Uh, so 30% over ideal body weight. Um, but severe obesity is two to three times over the ideal weight. So it's like a BMI above 40. And so uh, this is... Uh, Actually, I think maybe a 35 is, is morbid obesity. And so, um, anyways, typically, you know, I could disrupt a multi-billion dollar agent or industry by telling you my secret. Um, people gain weight by eating more calories than they burn. It's a very simple formula. Very, very simple. If you eat more calories, if you eat 5,000 calories a day and you only burn 2,000 of them through walking or living your life, 
um, you're going to put on weight, right? Your body will store that uh, energy in the form of fat. And so this is why patients will get obese. And so, um, you know, I know there's a lot of people think, oh, it's genetic. It's not, right? That's, that's very rare. Um, it's, it's environmental. Patients overeat. Um, and so uh, I'm not fat shaming at all. I'm just saying it's, it's a misnomer that like, oh, my whole family is o- overweight. It's genetic. No, it's your environment. Your whole family overeats. And so it is exceptionally rare for someone to truly have a genetic issue that causes them to be obese. Now, uh, now this may be a true to low metabolic rate or genetic predisposition. Like I just said, exceptionally rare, exceptionally rare. Now, this stretcher right here, like, what is that? This is a bariatric stretcher. And so the one we actually use at the training center is a bariatric stretcher. Um, and so you'll notice they're wider. Now, some ambulances even have ramps. And yes, that is a winch that you can hook to the stretcher and it will winch the patient into the ambulance so you don't have to push it in. And so, uh, those exist. They're called bariatric trucks. So the doors of the ambulance tend to be wider. Um, and so uh, those exist. Those are called bariatric stretchers. And so the quality of life is obviously negatively affected. And so, you know, the mobility issues, um, think about this, right? If, if, if you're supposed to be 200 pounds, right? And you're 400 pounds, imagine your current weight, but you put a whole nother one of you on your back and I say, hey, go walk around, go walk around Walmart. How do you think your joints are going to feel if you're carrying twice the weight you're supposed to be carrying? You know, how far do you think you're going to get? How short a breath are you going to get if I tell you carry a whole nother person on your back? Uh, that's what some of these patients are doing or more. They're carrying two or three people on them if they're 600 pounds. And this isn't uncommon. And I want to be very clear. I'm not fat shaming. I just want to share the empathy of these patients. I get it. Their joints hurt. They're tired. They're short of breath. They're worn out. Um, and so they have a lot of mobility issues. Uh, diabetes is very common, especially type 2 diabetes and those that are obese. They go together. Obesity and type 2 diabetes go together hand in hand. Uh, hypertension, uh, heart disease, stroke, all of these are risk factors of, you know, are, of, of, of having heart disease and stroke is being obese, uh, overweight, obese. And so the thing I'll say about obese patients is, as I say this all the time, these are human beings, right? These are God's creatures, right? These are, these are real people with real emotion. And it's embarrassing a lot of times. And so you need to be very, very careful with how you approach this in the EMS level. It's a little different at the doctor level. Um, but at the EMS level, you, uh, you, you're not going to convince a patient to lose weight on the ambulance ride, right? Or, or change their, their, their obesity. And so, the damage has been done, and so whether you like it or not, this this is we, we gotta take care of them, right? And so we need to take care of them. They deserve premium care, good care. And so with that said, uh, uh, plan for extra help. There used to be a lady, uh, I won't say where, somewhere in Parker County, to where every time when her address came out, we would send two ambulances, two engine companies, and a supervisor, because you would have to take out the stretcher from the ambulance and lay her on the floor. She was too big. We didn't have a bariatric cot at the time. And so, you know, we just knew if you go there, you need to send the cavalry because we need literally about 10 to 12 people to, to pull her out of the house on a tarp. And so uh, right before she died, we had told her, it's very sad, uh, that, that if she got any bigger, we were going to have to cut a hole in her door to extend her door so we could get her out. And she ended up dying in her 30s. And so um, she was, I mean, she was ginormous. I mean, she was like seven, 800 pounds. I'm not kidding. I mean, huge. And um, it's very, very sad. And uh, something to be mindful of, and I actually distinctly remember correcting some crew, some some of our teammates on this is is the groaning and the bitching and moaning when you're when you're moving these patients. I get it; they're heavy. There's a risk of injuring yourself, but uh, these are humans. And so, uh, the, again, the damage is done. And so, groaning and grunting and oh, uh, it, 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 it doesn't. What does it fix? And so, just be mindful of that uh, because I mean, it's just not necessary. Uh, treat the patient with dignity and respect. Ask the patient how is the best way to move him or her. So if it's your first time running this patient that's obese, um, you may have to ask her, hey, how did they get you out of the house last time? And they may tell you, oh, they took me through the back door because it's wider or whatever. Uh, avoid trying to lift the patient by one limb. You could obviously injure their, <laughs> their limb or pull it out of socket. Coordinate the communication and all moves to all team members prior to commencing lift. So this is where the good eye contact and truly coordinating with the team before the lift is important. And so uh, if the patient becomes uncontrollable, uncontrolled at any point, stop, reposition, or resume. So a lot of times we would have to move a few steps, stop, all right, let's plan. We're about to go through the door. You two go first, and then we're going to pull. We're going to get halfway. Yeah. And so these are all things that you're coordinating as you're doing it. Look for pinch or pressure points from the equipment. 
right? And so you could also get what's called a deep vein thrombosis. We've talked about this uh, just from, from pinching them or, or cutting off circulation. It's also common when you're th this obese. And then so large patients may have difficulty breathing if you lay them in a supine position. So this is where it's really difficult with her. Uh, this one patient is if you laid her completely flat, she truly couldn't breathe. The weight of her chest. I mean, imagine if I were to literally just sit my butt on your chest, right? At all my weight, right? 180 pounds on your chest, 165, excuse me. Um, you couldn't breathe. And so, I mean, these, these patients chest is that heavy. It's a hundred plus pounds laying on their chest. So they can't breathe if they lay flat. And so that was one of the things we had to coordinate when moving her out was we had to keep her sit up, but moving out the door. And so it's very complicated and difficult and, you know, you, someone would have to, two people would have to take a knee and just shove their hands in her back to hold her up when we were taking breath, you know, arrest to reposition her to get out the house. It's, it's a huge ordeal. It's very sad too. The neighbors would come out and watch because they knew, oh, when all the ambulances and fire trucks showed up, they're going to remove this patient out of her house. And so it was like a big spectacle. It was, it was very sad for her. And so, um, you know, there's specialized equipment available. There's, you need to plan an egress route, um, Towards the end of this patient's life, we were starting to coordinate with like uh, surrounding agencies that had bariatric trucks to where if we got a call there, we would request them on mutual aid. Uh, we never actually fulfilled that. Like we never did that, but we were planning that to where when we went out to this house that we were going to go ahead and request MedStar to send their bariatric truck. So we did not have one at the time. And so notify the receiving facility earlier. And so, you know, uh, <laughs> again... The same patient, if we took her to a hospital, we would have to have a f two fire trucks or at least one uh, meet us at the hospital. We can't get her out. Like, uh, and so, you know, we would tell them, hey, patient's around 800 pounds. We, you know, go ahead and request Fort Worth Fire to meet us at the hospital. And it was just this big ordeal. It was a, it was a bad deal for the patient and for everyone involved. It was, it was very sad. And so anyways, just you have to notify them earlier. A lot of times, too, they have to get what's called a bariatric bed. So they have hospital beds that are even bigger. Uh, to accommodate this patient, but those are usually not found in the ER, so they're going to have to get that from upstairs, and that takes time, so call the hospital early. And so next thing is called a tracheostomy tube, and so this is, a trachea is the windpipe in the front of your throat, and so basically what this is is a tube that goes into directly into your throat right here. The opening is called a stoma, and it and it, so it bypasses the patient's mouth and nose, and so um, it, this could be temporary or permanent, and so uh, the, the patients that have like chronic pulmonary issues or those that live on a ventilator, you know, it's not ideal to have a, to a tube in their mouth. So we just put it in their neck and, and attach the ventilator to this. And so uh, this opening is called a stoma. Okay. And so the opening is called a stoma. This thing is called a tracheostomy tube. Okay. And uh, that's kind of what you need to know. The tubes are not very big. This is what they look like. And so it's a tube that's like, a few inches long and at the end there's a cuff that you can blow up with a little syringe. You just push air into this little port right here and it blows it up and that keeps what keeps it in, in place. And so this is, you know, a cannula that will go down into the trachea. Now, the carina is not very far past where they put these tubes. It's only a few inches. Remember, the carina is the bifurcation where you go from the left to the left and right lung from the trachea. And so you don't have to go very far to be, in, you know, into the right lung or something like that. So these are uh, prone to obstruction by mucus or foreign bodies. And so we have typically um, mechanisms in our, in our trachea and especially in our throat and our nose and our mouth to clear mucus. We can swallow it, move it, whatever, uh, spit it out. You can't do that uh, if it's not making its way up to the mouth. And so they're very inclined to get the mucus, like a big snotty booger that hardens into this tube. And if that tube becomes obstructed, whether partially or fully, you can end up with some pretty serious ventilatory issues, right? So if you make this tube that's only this big, this big, because now it's obstructed with uh, mucus, that's a problem. So you got to remove it. How do we remove that? You can uh, suction it. And so the family will always have a suction unit and they know how to remove this. Sometimes, we'll show you how to do this in class, you have to put a little bit of normal saline down this tube, like literally just like a few drops, a couple drops, to soften up that snotty booger to where you can actually unlodge it and suck it out uh, with the suction unit. Again, I can't stress enough, the family will be subject matter experts in this. Now, the problem with these tracheostomy tubes too is they can fall out. So sometimes they pop out. Well, when, when they pop out, you have to worry about this tube 
this opening, the stoma is called the opening, uh, closing off. It can get smaller in size. It can constrict. And so in getting strict, you know, it could theoretically constrict if it's out for a period of hours, it could constrict so much it completely close off. And so, and also it's a lot easier for it to become obstructed with mucus. And so there's all these issues that present with this. Um, and so be aware of that. Now, also, if the patient is, um, has one of these tubes, if you use a BVM on the nose and mouth, it ain't going to go down to the lungs. And so you don't use a BVM when they have this tube down here in their throat. You have to ventilate directly over the stoma or to the tube. Does that make sense? Because this is sitting in their trachea and it's completely sealed off because they have this balloon inflated. So if you're pushing air this way, right, from the mouth up here, you're not going to make it past this this balloon. So you have to ventilate directly on this stoma or directly on this tube. Okay. Now there's this, this will be tested. There's this mnemonic called DOTE. All right. And so this is a, uh, a mnemonic we use in airway tubes like intubation or tracheostomy tubes or whatever. This is something we used when things go wrong. It's a, it's an algorithm to help us uh, uh, troubleshoot. Okay. And so the first one is called displacement. So the tube has been moved. It's been displaced. And so remember the if this is the patient's right, this is the patient's left, this is their head, this is their trachea, it goes into the crina like this. So this is the right lung. Okay, here's the crina right here. But the left lung kind of juts off like that, these two tubes. So if you push this tube too far down, it'll always go into the right lung. And so if you're ever ventilating a patient and you only see chest rise on the right side, the tube has bypassed the carina and it's in the right lung. So that's something to be very aware of. This is very real world. It does happen. I promise you will see this. Okay. So if that happens, the tube needs to be pulled back because you're in too far. You're in too deep. Okay. Now, uh, obstruction of endotracheal tubes. So this could be by secretions, saliva, spit, mucus, a foreign body, food, right? A toy. I don't know. Uh, it could be in there or it could be kinked. That tube could get kinked. Okay. Uh, you'll see this sometimes when you use a ventilator, it'll kink that tube from the weight of the ventilator tubing. It'll kink it. Okay. Uh, now the next one is for the P and dope is a pneumothorax. Remember all that will start off as a simple pneumothorax and it can progress into a tension pneumothorax where it obstructs the heart's great vessels and it creates a form of obstructive shock. What are the signs of a pneumothorax? Uh, diminished or absent breath sounds, decreased breath sounds on one side. Uh, jugular venous distension, decreased pulse oximetry, increased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, uh, altered mental status, tachypnea, right? Those are the things that we would watch for. Um, and so the last one is equipment failure. So you could have you, your vent became disconnected. Uh, there could be a link or a leak in your vent circuit, like a hole or something, two connections that aren't tight enough. Uh, your vent could fail, right? So the E is for equipment failure. Some type of equipment, whether it's the tube or the vent has failed, okay? And so the common problems are bleeding or air leaking around the tube. The tube can become loose or dislodged. It's probably the most common thing that I've seen. Uh, and so you get there and they're like, oh, we don't have another tube. Takes the hospital and, and they'll, they'll put another one in. And so sometimes you have to do that. And so the tube can come, uh, the opening around the tube may become infected. That is quite a possibility. Uh, as well. And so remember the infection, there's inflammation, so you have to worry about that hole getting too tight. Uh, and so the management is maintain open airways, suction tube if necessary to clear up. And those big snotty boogers I was talking about, they're not called that, they're called a mucus plug. Right? So it's a plug of mucus that's blocking that uh, tube. Uh, maintain the position, a position of comfort, right? Administer supplement oxygen and provide transport to the hospital. So remember that dope mnemonic, you will be tested on it, I promise. Um, so the two types of oxygen delivery devices for home oxygen, right? So typically it's in a, in a gas cylinder or most commonly that's when they're portable, like in their car, you'll see it in a concentrator. These are the little machines that plug into the wall and, uh, concentrate oxygen from the, uh, the environment for the patient. And so, uh, you know what a compressed oxygen cylinder is, right? Um, so they're heavy, bulky, they're difficult to transport. Eventually it's going to run out of gas. And so patients coordinate pickup and delivery of cylinders at their home. Usually their home health will, will manage that. Now, the, the concentrator, you've seen this, so it takes uh, ambient air and it scrubs out the nitrogen to concentrate the oxygen in the air to increase that, okay? And so it can provide an unlimited supply of oxygen, but the problem is these require electricity. So now, you can see these battery-powered, and so those these are becoming more common because they're not as heavy as a tank, and, and the battery can last 8, 10, 12 hours, as opposed to like a, a tank can last a couple hours, and they're heavy. And so the patient must have a backup compressed gas cylinder in case of a power failure. Okay. 
And so, you you know, anytime someone's an auction, you know, you could ask them how many liters of auction are you wearing? And they'll say two or three. And so, you know, the next good question I'll ask is, well, how long have you been using two liters? And they're like, oh, well, normally I'm on one liter, but last night I turned it up without telling my doctor. And so these are usually pretty strict on these numbers. You don't want people on oxygen at home. And so you'll find patients will self-medicate and increase their oxygen without a doctor's order because they just literally have to turn a vial. Uh, and so eh, that happens. But, you know, ZMTs, you can increase it in the short term. So, yes, if someone's wearing two liters and you think they need an honor breather or they need four or six liters, you're authorized to do that. But what I'll say is sometimes you'll see patients, you ask them, how many liters are you wearing? They're like, oh, I'm wearing four liters. And you'll say, do you normally wear four liters? No, I just increased it last night or today. Right? So be aware of that. That would be their baseline. Okay? And so mechanical ventilators, uh, this is a, a true ventilator. Uh, we'll show you what these look like in class. We have ventilators, obviously, on the ambulance. Uh, they're not really home ventilators, but they have the very similar concept. These are essentially BVMs. These are machines that will BVM someone, right, that will force air in there 12 or 16 times a minute at 500 tidal volume with a little bit of peep or whatever to, uh, to, to, to ventilate the patient, okay? So this can be for different regions, right? Congenital defect, chronic lung disease, right, traumatic brain injury to where the brain stem has or, or the, the diaphragm has been impaired. Uh, muscular dystrophy, so you can see this when the muscles get really weak. You can see this in late stage, uh, like multiple sclerosis. You can see this in really, you know, like Guillain Barre syndrome, uh, AMLS, stuff like that. You can see these in like uh, muscular issues. If the ventilator malfunctions, you're going to remove the patient from the ventilator uh, and you're going to start providing them face mask over the stoma and start ventilating them, right? And so you can, um, the, the BVM will connect to the tracheostomy. If the tracheostomy is there, leave the trachea. You could ventilate straight to the tracheostomy. But um, if that's not there, or you see in a test question, you could just do the face mask over the stoma. Now with that, you may have to use a pediatric face mask that's small enough to fit on the neck that just needs to fit over that little bitty stoma. Apnea monitors are becoming more common. These used to go around the waist, like this picture here. What's more common now is you can, these are actually pretty cheap and I recommend them. Um, you, you can put the, it's like a pulse oximetry sock that you put on your baby when they sleep and it provides a link to the parents to where if the sats drop below like whatever percentage, 90%, uh, it sets off a very loud alarm to wake everyone up to say, hey, there might be something wrong with baby, okay? Um, so this is used in infants. Uh, so you can use these two weeks to two months after birth to monitor the respiratory systems. And like I said, it sounds an alarm. If they get like bradycardic or apneic or something like that, uh, and so again, these could go around the chest with electrodes. It could also, I, like the more common one that I've seen now in 2024 is it's like a sock that you put on the baby. Now, internal cardiac pacemakers, these are uh, pretty common. And so it looks like a deck of cards up underneath the chest. Now, you would think this would be on the left side of the chest, but it can be on either side of the chest. On the, this is obviously the patient's right. And so it can be on either side. So this is the actual machine right there. And so what's happening is it is a... Uh, it's got wires that are connecting from this machine that's reading the heart's rhythm that connect to different points in the heart that can either set the heart's pace, right? So maybe the heart wants to beat 30 times a minute, but this pacemaker says, nope, you're going to beat 70 times a minute. So it's going to send electricity 70 times a minute to, sh to, to shock this heart into the right rhythm to set the pace. It's a pacemaker. The other way this can happen is if the patient goes into a lethal arrhythmia like V-fib or V-tac, um, it can be what's called an automatic internal cardiac defibrillator or an AICD, automatic internal cardiac defibrillator. So this is like an AED that's implanted in the chest to where it's constantly sampling the heart's rhythm. And if it's like, oh, wow, you're in a rhythm that needs to be shocked at a high amount of electricity, it'll zap them and it'll shock them. And so it'll defibrillate. And so just be aware of that. These are common. They have fairly long battery lives. Um, and so let me distinguish between the two, the pacemaker where it's telling your heart beat 70 times a minute, patients will not feel that, right? Patients don't feel that 70 times a minute. Now the AICD, when it sends 200 joules of electricity straight to their heart or however many joules, um, a lot of electricity in one really quick, powerful dose, they will feel that. And so I've ran patients before where they're like, I felt it go off seven times since I've called 911. And so you're like, holy cow, something is terribly wrong. And so be aware of that. They'll fill the, the AICD. They'll fill the defibrillator. Now, it's not uncommon now for these to do both, to where it's one device that is both a pacemaker and an AICD. Now, 
Could you have one that's just a pacemaker? Yes. Could you have one that's just an AICD? Yes, but it's most common in my experience where you'll see them that do both. Now, uh, so these are very, very common. Now, I need to make you aware of something. A very powerful magnet is how you turn these off. And so if someone's in cardiac arrest and their pacemaker's still firing and everyone's determined they're dead, uh, you put a very, very powerful magnet above that device and it'll turn it off. Okay, so kind of a factoid you might need to know. Now, LVADs, this is a left ventricular, ventricular assist device. They're called LVADs. And so the left ventricle is pumping blood up to my head and down to my toe. And so what happens is in heart failure, that left ventricle becomes weak. And so what we can do is we can put some tubes up in the heart that will pump blood out of the left ventricle through this little pump and into the aorta. So it's assisting. It's called a left ventricular assist device. It's assisting the left ventricle to pump blood out of the left ventricle and up into the aorta. And so these devices um, are, are, are actually not as common as they used to be, but, but they still exist. And so um, these are typically like to buy a patient time between now and the time they get a heart transplant. So waiting on a donor to give them a new heart. And so the problem with this is it can be very difficult to palpate a pulse because it may not be a pulse that's really pumping blood up to the head and down to the heart. It's not the actual heart. It's this pump. And so this pump, uh, you're not going to feel that like a pulse. So with that, you're not going to hear a good blood pressure as well. And so don't be freaking out. Um, and so that would just be document. Patient has no bad, no pulse is palpated, but the cap refill is however many seconds. You know, patient's alert and oriented, blah, blah, blah. And so uh, be aware, you may not get a pulse and because there's not a pulse, you may not get a blood pressure. And so you provide, uh, you know, basic care. And so use the caregiver as a resource. There used to be this guy in Willow Park that had one of these and he came by the station and showed everybody what it was. And his doctor had like an information packet for us and we just put it on the fridge uh, with the patient's name and address, his request, name, address, and some of the instructions if, if he goes into cardiac arrest, what to do. And so... Um, the, the care for these, if they go into cardiac arrest, you just, it's normal CPR. Now, some of them, I won't tell you that. Anyways, some of them are different. You'll figure that out when you're in the field. Now, this next one is a little different. These are called life vests. So, you know, like when you go swimming in a lake and you wear a life vest, someone thought, oh, what a cool name. And so this is an AED that the patient wears home. And so this is a bridge between the time of them getting like an AICD implanted, uh, and, and being discharged from the hospital. And, and so it's like a, a, a temporary measure. And so they wear this vest like this guy's wearing um, that's, a, that's an AED. And so it's constantly sampling the monitor, but it's external. And so it's an external defibrillatory vest to where if, if it recognizes like, oh, patients in this lethal arrhythmia, we need to defibrillate them, boom, it hits them. And so uh, I, again, I've ran patients that have these. Uh, it's a temporary measure, usually like a few weeks at the most. If the patient is in cardiac arrest, the vest should remain in place while I perform CPR. I could see that being like a quiz question. So just leave the vest. Now, a central venous catheter. And so these are, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a catheter, like an IV, right? But it's going deeper. It's going into like a central vein, like the, you know, the, the uh, uh, which one is it? Not cephalic. I can't think of the name of it. I think it is cephalic. Subclavian, duh. Um, that's it. And so what happens is you will go into these big veins and um, like, like the neck and there's a wire with a tube that goes a little bit further. So we'll dump this into like the superior vena cava or right here in the subclavian or something like that. And um, we just dump it. And so that way it's dumping right into like a lot of blood. And so the reason we give this is like with very powerful antibiotics or like total parenteral nutrition to where people can't eat. So we got to give them all their nutrients through their IV basically into their blood directly into their blood. We'll do it that way. You can also see this is a is like a temporary measure for dialysis as well. But um, this is usually temporary. You don't want this forever, um, and so um, because you can get infection from them, that's like a huge risk. You can get infection. Uh, bacteria can climb up this tube and into the blood, and then boom, you now have infection all the way to your heart. And so um, these are are fairly common. You could also see these in the arm. You know. Uh, it's a little more comfortable there as opposed to your neck. You can see these in the chest, the neck. You can see them all sorts of places. And so that's what they look like, okay? 
So again, the line can the problems with these is the line could break. It's plastic after all. You get infection around the line. That's probably the most severe complication. You can get clots. That's still a problem as well. And bleeding from around the line or tube where it's attached. Okay, that would be rare, but that is a possibility, especially in like an NDIC or something like that. Now, gastrostomy tubes, when I say gastro, it sounds like the stomach, right? So it's dealing with like the GI system. Um, so these are, a gastrostomy tube is placed in the stomach for patients who cannot uh, uh, ingest food, fluids, or, or medications by mouth. So maybe this patient has like esophageal cancer or mouth cancer, or uh, they just can't, they don't have the muscles necessary to swallow, whatever. Uh, we can put a tube somewhere in the GI tract other than the mouth to get food down to the stomach or, or the intestines. And so the most common, or I wouldn't say the most common, a common place this will happen is in the stomach, and this is called a gastrostomy tube. So remember, gastrostomy equals, this is a stomach tube. This is a tube that we literally drill a hole in the stomach, and we will put a tube in there, and we it, it, enter, it exits throughout the, the abdominal wall, and we'll inject like like a thick slurry type food into the patient's stomach, okay? That's called a G-tube. And so a lot of times these come with just a button. And so they'll call it a G-button, okay? Or a G-tube button or whatever you want to call it. And so, excuse me, um, that's the most, that's pretty common. You'll see this in, in, in like chronically ill kids and chronically ill patients. It's, it's not uncommon to see this, by the way. And so, um, the problem that I've seen in EMS is these tubes will fall out. And so if this tube pops out, right, this, the, the, the hole can close up. Also, the stomach, I mean, theoretically, the stomach contents could leak out into the abdomen. So that also creates a problem. And so there could be pro or bleeding or whatever. And so the, you, if, if these pop out, it's a very quick trip to the closest hospital because they need to very quickly push something into that hole uh, to keep it from closing up. And so these patients go straight to a room usually, and you'll usually shove whatever you got, a fully cap, not us, but doctors, a full, something into this tube or to that hole to keep it from closing. Now, um, let me tell, show you what these other ones are. And so that's the G button. It could also just be a tube. It could be uh, like a Foley catheter or something like that, that that goes into the stomach. That's a gastrostomy tube. It goes straight through the abdominal wall into the stomach, okay? And so they're showing you a kid right here with one. Now, the 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 tube can become dislodged and so if that happens if they're receiving their their meals or whatever or fluid you need to stop immediately giving that because um it's just going to leak out or it's leaking into the abdomen that's also a small possibility and so you're going to assess for signs and symptoms of bleeding in the stomach so this could be vague abdominal discomfort nausea vomiting especially if you have coffee ground emesis remember hematemesis and so this would be like partially digest blood. So when blood touches the stomach, it gets partially digested. It looks like coffee grounds when you vomit it up. And blood in the emesis. You could just see frank blood. Remember if someone's bringing frank, they're just being obvious. And so that's uh, just frank blood. And so the, the thing about gastrostomy tubes is they're at an increased risk of aspiration. And so typically these patients, um, they're, they're, they have these tubes because they can't swallow for whatever reason. There's a blockage, they, they can't coordinate the movement and swallowing, whatever. And so they're at a high risk of aspiration. And so remember, just because you're putting contents down here does not mean it can't travel its way up through the esophagus and into the mouth. And so there's a risk of, of aspiration, okay? Um, okay, shunts, I've covered this quick, uh, briefly, but remember, they, there's these, okay, this is what's normal. There's normally these ventricles in your brain, right? And these are fluid-filled spaces with cerebral spinal fluid in the brain. This is their normal size. In hydrocephalus or in certain disorders, these pockets can swell really, really large. And a general pathology of the brain, pathophysiology, is if the brain gets pushed on, it's not going to work well. And so how we fix this is uh, we'll take a tube and we'll stick it into, like you can see what they did here, into this ventricle a surgeon does this a neurosurgeon and we'll have it stick in there and it travels down usually around the like the base of the skull and, and it'll dump somewhere into either the chest or the abdomen and so it just dumps that cerebral spinal fluid down there and so um uh, sometimes you can even feel these like behind the ear or in the back of the head i felt that you can like on like if they don't have a lot of hair especially you can feel this tube well um the the or they're talking about the fluid reservoir, but you can sometimes feel this tube. The thing you should know is this tube can get clogged, right? And so if it becomes clogged or infected or whatever, 
then the fluid in the head's going to build up. And so just be aware of that. Um, um, you know, so they're going to present with stroke-like symptoms actually, right? So they'll have like headache, altered mental status. They could have hemiparesis, hemiparesis, slurred speech, all those things. Right. And so, uh, just be aware of that. Now, um, uh, Infection may occur within two months of, of insertion. This is obviously a very major surgery, but this is sometimes what you have to do to keep these patients alive because if this cavity gets too big, their, their brain's not going to work and they would die. And so there's two types of uh, uh, ones. The ventricular peritoneal shunt this is the most common one. It's called a VP shunt. Um, this is where it dumps it from the ventricle down into the, uh, the, the peritoneum, which is like the abdominal cavity. The ventricular atrium uh, shunt, I'm pretty sure that one just dumps it into the thorax. I could be wrong on that. I mean, you have to look that one up. So how do you know someone has a VP shunt? Well, sometimes these are infants, like newborns, like very small kids. So they can't raise their head and be like, hey, bro, my head hurts. So you'll, they'll get this, what's known as a high-pitched cry. So it's not your normal cry, like your wah, wah, wah. It's a very high-pitched cry, very painful cry. Something is very wrong when you hear this cry. And so uh, you remember the fontanelles? There are the soft spots in the skull of a baby where their skull is not fused together. Directly underneath that is the dura matter of the, of the meninges. And so these can be bulged in meningitis, shaken baby syndrome, and also in hydrocephalus. So when the brain has too much water, that pressure will escape upwards through that fontanelle. Obviously, you can imagine if there's a lot of pressure on your brain, you're going to have headache, pro projectile vomiting, ultramental status, irritability. If there's infection present, you would have fever and nausea. Um, you could also see uh, like ataxia where they have this hard time walking uh, because they're, they're almost, I mean, their, their brain's being pushed on, so it's not going to work well, especially the cerebellum. And so blurred vision, seizures, redness along the shunt track, like where you can see that track is, is infected. That would be very obvious. Uh, bradycardia um, and then heart dysrhythmias. The, uh, so that's it for the shunts. Now, vagus nerve simulators, these are not very... These are becoming more common, but basically they use these to, to control seizures, okay? And so but these are for status epilepticus, right? Like patients that you just can't control with conventional means. You can put a, a stimulator that's implanted in the chest that goes to the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, um, that, that, that stimulates this to prevent seizures, right? And so, um, you know, you, it's in children older than 12. It's located in the patient's skin. It's about the size of a silver dollar. Uh, if you encounter the patient with this device, contact medical control or follow your local protocols. Don't have a lot to add on that. Now, these colostomy tubes, ileostomies and urostomies, these are a little confusing, but if you break down the words, they make sense, right? So colostomy tube is referring to the colon, right? Ileostomy is referring to the ileus, right? So it's referring to the small bowel. And then a urostomy is like urine, right? So we're talking about the ureters, okay? And so... Um, this is where you'll put a, a surgical opening from the colon, ileum, ureters, to the external, right, to the outside world, through the abdominal cavity wall. And so um, these are not uncommon, actually, to where you'll see this after major bowel surgeries or with bowel cancer or abdominal cancer or whatever. Uh, I've done, I did several of these when I was in my surgical rotation, and so um, they're fairly common. And so this one right here is a colostomy. And so this opening, just like the one in the neck, is called a stoma. And so this is their bowel that we have cut and we have rolled out into the outside abdominal wall, sewed it to the wall. And so now when they poop, it's not going to go all the way down. It's going to stop here and empty into this bag. Okay, so normally there's a bag that's attached to this that catches the feces, okay, that's sealed to the skin. And so that is called a colostomy bag, okay? Now, the next one is called an ileostomy, okay? So this is where we take the small intestine and we protrude it outside of the abdominal wall. By the way, these can be anywhere on the wall. They're not always on the right lower or left lower. They can be anywhere, okay? Now, what the, the problem about an ileostomy bag is the colon is being bypassed, right? So normally food goes mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, colon, and then you poop it out. But in this case, it's going mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and it's going straight out into the world. And so normally, you're, since you're not using the colon, the colon absorbs a lot of fluid. So this, this, these bags didn't have a lot of water in it. So the patient's at a higher risk of dehydration. Um, I actually saw a patient yesterday with one of these things having severe complications with this. In fact, I think he'll probably die from it. Um, and so 
just be aware that, that dehydration is a huge, huge issue with uh, ileostomies. Now, this last one, not as common, is called a urostomy bag. And so this is where they take go straight from the ureters to a bag on the external. So this is just urine. I've only seen that a few times. You can also see what's called a nephrostomy tube, where they'll just take a tube into the, the ureter, one ureter, to drain it that way. I've seen that as well. And so uh, assess the patient for dehydration. Remember, these patients get very dehydrated because you're some, the colon has been compromised, and the job of the colon more or less is to, to absorb water from, from your food. And so area around the stoma is prone to infection. It's also prone to skin breakdown. Your abdominal skin wall is not like your butt cheek skin. It's not thick. And so uh, it's, it's just likely to get infected if the size of that bag does not line up perfectly with that stoma. Imagine if you lay human feces on your skin all day, you're, you know, on your abdomen. You're going to get infection, skin breakdown, and then infection. And so just be aware of that. It can be very tender, very painful. Um, so infection with these is very common. The urostomy thing, that's where the connects the urinary uh, system to the surface of the skin. And so that's kind of it. We'll run through this patient assessment, do these questions real quick. And so, you know, their interaction with the caregiver is an important part of the patient assessment process. There are experts. These are experts in caring for these patients, determine the patient's normal baseline status before the assessment, what is different today type stuff. Um, you know, the home care, this occurs in the home. Represents the spectrum of populations, right? And so I've seen home care for really young, really old, everything in between. And so these cares can vary. It depends on the need level. But, you know, sometimes it, they'll do meals. Sometimes it's a full-time caregiver that lives in with them 24-7, right? Uh, they'll do laundry, maintenance around the house, physical therapy, personal care, right? So a lot of times it's a team approach. Um, and so EMS may be called to the residence by a home care provider, right? And so sometimes these people have been... The caregiver, like these home health agencies, have been with the patient for years or decades, and so they know the patient really well, so be kind and value that, their expertise in this patient, okay? Um, so let's talk about hospice and terminally ill patients. Um, terminally ill patients may receive hospice care at a hospice facility. These are less common, I find, or more common now. You're seeing this at home. Uh, patients prefer to die at home. And so uh, if you're on hospice, you must have a DNR order. Remember, DNR means do not resuscitate. That does not mean do not treat. So do not resuscitate means that you do not initiate chest compressions and ventilations with a BVM. Or, you know, cardiac, like epinephrine and stuff like that. And so um, you may have medical orders uh, for for scope of their treatment, right? And so now there is something different. And so we have what's called comfort care, and this is what's called palliated care. And so this is where we get uh, the patient will have a pain medicine and anti-anxiety medication. And so we make the patient comfort, comfort, comfortable care or comfort care. We have comfortable prior to death. Okay. And so um, this, this is, this is common. Uh, follow local protocols, the patient's wishes and legal documents, bring documentation to the hospital, show compassion, of course. Um, and so, uh, Ascertain the family's wishes regarding transport. One thing I'll say, just because someone's on hospice, you, the, the family can legally revoke that. What does that mean? That means they could be on hospice and they call 911 because the patient is in agonal breathing and they're like, nope, do everything. Start CPR. We don't want to honor the DNR. Generally, it's better to honor the family's wishes and initiate CPR. Okay, um, And so uh, that, that happens. So it's called hospice revocation. And so that we encounter that EMS where the family is not well trained or versed in what to do. So which in a good hospice agency will, will educate the family and say, don't call EMS, call us, we'll help you right uh, through that journey of, of the patient dying. Poverty and homelessness. This is a growing problem in the United States, unfortunately, uh, with the with affordable housing and, and poverty and drug use and all these other issues. But anyways, um, Basically, if you're poverty or you know or homeless, you're not going to be able to provide your your your, your needs. And so, um, this is a. I think that I I watched a documentary on the increased incidence of disease in the homeless. It's it's very high. I think like you're ten times more likely to die. Or I don't remember that it was very very high if you're homeless from a disease, which makes sense. You know, if you're camping on the streets of of Dallas, you're not going to do well compared to someone living in a home recovering from a chronic illness or surgery or something like that. And so the patients can have mental illness. This is quite common, prior brain trauma, domestic violence victims, right? So they're escaping or fleeing violence or, you know, asylum seekers or refugees or whatever you want to call it. You know, there's, there's different ways people can end up homeless. Uh, addiction, where they've spent all the money that they need on their addiction instead of housing. 
uh, an impoverished family, so poor people, just straight up poor people. And so, again, I say it all the time, these are human beings, these are God's creatures, right? And so we need to be kind to them and, and empathetic and realize that uh, they may not they may not want, I mean, I don't, can't imagine someone wanting to be homeless, but uh, they're in that situation. And so we need to be kind and help them with that. Okay. These are humans. And so all healthcare providers must provide treatment and treatment uh, transport regarding, uh, regardless of the patient's ability to pay. And so that law is called EMTALA. Remember the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act that says, if you are actively in labor, have a medical emergency, uh, emergency rooms will stabilize you and provide a transfer to an appropriate facility. And so uh, become familiar with social service resources within your community. Um, oh, cool. We're at the review. Good. Let's wrap this up. So what's the following is a uh, developmental disorder characterized by impairment of social interaction. Social issues, right? This is autism. Autism. You can pause this if you want. Uh, no... Uh, risk factors for Down syndrome include uh, uh, smoking, lack of or traumatic brain injury at birth, increased maternal age. It is increased maternal age by far. Okay, you're much more likely to have a, a Down's kid if if the mom's over 45. Much, much, much more likely. Interestingly, this is the 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 vitamin that if you're defective of. Uh, I want to say it's vitamin B6. Uh, you can end up with a uh, 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 spina bifida, that neural tube defect. Which following may be difficult to perform on a patient with Down syndrome? Uh, all of the above, but definitely CPR. Well, you're not going to be intubating them. EMTs don't intubate. <laughs> this is out of your EMT textbook. Uh, intubation would be very difficult for these patients because they have a small mouth, big tongue. But CPR, if you're using a BVM, is also going to be difficult. This is a terrible question. Again, I haven't looked at these. I'm going to go intubation. Yeah, I don't like that question. CPR with a BVM, if you're using a BVM, it will be very difficult on a Downs kid. Or, or adult. These can be adults, by the way. That's a bad question. Patient, most patients with the with this disease also have hydrocephalus. Remember hydrocephalus, big brain or big big head because of water on the brain. It's going to be the spina bifida. And sometimes, yeah, we have to place a shunt. Okay, what does the dope mnemonic help you recognize? Yeah, uh, well. Yeah, airway obstruction as, as it relates to like a tube down the throat. Endotracheal tube, tracheostomy, something like that. Yeah, airway obstruction. So remember, displacement, obstruction, uh, pneumothorax, and equipment failure. What a great rationale on this one. This is not a correct answer. No way. You know, I didn't rationalize them, but anyways. Uh, what device is placed directly into the stomach to feed patients? Okay, the stomach. The stomach, right? The keyword here, whoops, the keyword here being the stomach, okay? It's going to be a gastrostomy tube. The ileostomy tube, where does that go? To the small bowel. Where does this go? To the large intestine or the colon, right? Same thing. These are the, that means the same thing. So, yeah. Central venous catheter, right? That goes to the heart. Uh, what do vagal nerve stimulators do? I mean, technically D, technically. Yeah, they act, it is an alternative. That's risky. It's not really an alternative form of treatment. It's a, it's a form of treatment when the medication tr therapy has failed, but that is by definition not alternative treatment, so I hope I don't get it wrong, but T is probably the most correct. Okay, cool. Alternative treatment, by the way, is referring to like acupuncture, herbal medicine, stuff like that, by the actual definition of alternative medicine, by the way. So again, terrible question. Shout out, JV Learning. Um, an important part of the assessment process for a patient with special needs is to... Yeah, I mean, you could interact with a patient. I think that's important to not forget. 
but you would also interact with, I mean, that's, I mean, these are both very important. I would say talk to the patient. You should talk to the patient first and fill in the gaps with the caregiver. But I do think you should honor the caregiver's expertise, but I'm going to go B and I hope I don't get it wrong. And I got it wrong. Cool. Don't listen to me. Um, interaction with the caregiver or a child uh, of a child or adult with special needs will be extremely important. They are trained to use and troubleshoot problems with medical equipment. I agree with that, but I think that's too vague of a question because I do think that you should interact with the patient as much as possible uh, while also interacting with the caregiver or parent as an alternative and, and supplementation too. Uh, what improves the patient quality of life shortly before death? Uh, comfort care. Yeah, comfort care. We give them pain medicine. Lots of pain medicine. Powerful pain medicines. Because if they quit breathing, great. You know, they're, they're about to die anyway, so we would rather them die without pain. Oh, the, the, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. Oh, wow. I just said that. EMTALA states that uh, patients should only be treated if they can pay for care. No, that's wrong. Uh, all patients must be treated. Yes. Yeah, B. Now, I will say it's only emergency departments that have to follow that rule. In fact, it's only med emergency. I th it, I'm pretty sure it's only emergency departments that receive federal funding, like Medicare, Medicaid. Some freestandings don't have to follow that. I don't think I could be wrong, but anyways, that's it for this chapter. I appreciate y'all's attention.